All right, on today's episode of Behind the Front Door, we have a special guest. Oh. This is your former um, Golden Girl. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so we were started at like the top three, now we're just, we got one Golden Girl. The right? original. <laughs> just the original. Miss Kathleen Manuel. Uh, did I get it right? You did. You did. Awesome, <laughs> awesome. Welcome to Behind the Front Door uh, podcast. Thanks so much for being here. Such a pleasure to be here. Um, we have a lot to catch up on. Yes, we do. Uh, with our audience. So, um, how do you want to kick this off, Mr. Broker? Mr. Well, I think I'll, I'll, I'll jump in because I, at the time when we met, it was 2018. Mm-hmm. Hard to believe, right? And uh, you were in, you, re- you kind of ran up into our DMs, right? <laughs> the and, first and only time yes. I've been on somebody's DMs. <laughs> when a Latina joins your DM, you can respond. It could be trouble, though. So. <laughs> right, right, right. Um, but... You know, give us a little bit of uh, background, maybe where you, uh, you know, born and raised, Mm -hmm. a little background, because the point of this show, um, our podcast, is to take people really behind the front door of really, really what happens. Everybody has a story. Everybody has a journey. So we like to start off by give us a little background to the audience. So before we jump in, can we... Do a toast. Yes, let's do yes. that. Let's we do that. Start a conversation <laughs> with Alex. So, welcome to Behind the Front Door. Hey, can you reach? I can reach. <laughs> <laughs> now I'm ready for your background. All right. Well, I was born and raised uh, in New York, Manhattan specifically. Mm-hmm. Um, mom, dad. Um, mom's Puerto Rican. Dad is half Puerto Rican, half Dominican. That's a real thing. It is a real thing. Because in my former life, when I was married to them, <laughs> so that's not the thing. So no, I'm a I'm a mutt. Um, I have an older <laughs> brother, and um, we lived in Washington Heights slash Inwood, mm-hmm. uh, and that was where I was born, raised, and and grew up most of my life. You still rep, still rep I New still, York. I still rep. <laughs> Uh, I will always, it's the streets that raised me. Um, I am who I am, not only because of my parents, but the environment that I grew up in. Um, you know, in the, in the 80s, yeah. uh, New York wasn't easy. Yeah. Uh, 80s is, is it easy now? <laughs> no, no, it's not. It's not. But uh, I'm very proud of um, where I come from, for sure. Absolutely. Mm-hmm. So tell us a little bit about, um, we like to hear people's background when it comes to especially real estate. Mm-hmm. You know, we'll get to how... Um, a little preview we saw with the DM thing, but um, did, had you been a homeowner before up there in New York and kind of tell like no. your story? Yeah, no, we uh, lived in a one bedroom apartment. Okay. Um, at the time it was my parents, my older brother and myself. Yeah. Around seven years old, my parents broke up. Mm-hmm. Um, two years later, my mom remarried and had two other children. Mm. Uh, we um, Up until I was 18, I lived in the same apartment. Uh, it's a one bedroom apartment. We were uh, a family of five or six in the one bedroom wow. rental and sometimes seven oh. um, because, you know, my mom actually divided the uh, kitchen mm. and made a fake wall and made like a little, it wasn't even a bedroom. I mean, it was just like a little space mm-hmm. with bunk beds. Oh, wow. um, and that's where my brother and I stayed. And then one day we came home from school and there was a lady there. And so we, my mom moved us from there into everybody was in the bedroom together Mm. um and you know later on in life i realized my mom was just doing all that she could to survive so she was renting a bed um, to help her pay the rent wow Mm -hmm. what did she do for a living my mom did everything under the book she is a hustler um she worked at a candy shop she worked as a bus driver she worked um as a clerk um, anything that she did to provide to, for her children. Did you at that time though, um, did you feel like you had less than what all your friends had or did you just kind of feel like that was how everybody, you know, how everybody was living, so to speak? You yeah, know, that's a great question. I think a lot of people in my neighborhood live the same way. Um, you know, maybe less people inside a house, but you know, a lot of, a lot of one single parent home, a lot of single mothers raising multiple kids. Um, two to four kids yeah. and all of the kids that I grew up with who still remain friends and family to me to this day mm-hmm. um, We look back. We're like our moms are incredible because they yeah. did it on you know practically on their own Well, the reason why I asked you that question specifically is because I, I know that you know when we met Yeah, I used to describe my upbringing sort of like a Cosby kid where I I didn't really feel like we were poor. We had less than I think in my adult life looking back I think that we were just 
we had a little bit more than the poorest. Mm -hmm. So it made me feel like I was the Cosby kid. Yeah. But in hindsight, no, we were we were actually borderline poor. I mean, I came from a working class, you know, parents and things like that. Mm -hmm. um, but they just always provided. And it wasn't really until I got older that I realized the true sacrifice that was being made all that time to keep me from even realizing just how mm, low budget our situation really <laughs> was. So yeah. I'm always curious to, to learn from somebody else that grew up uh, with you know a lot of people in the household or just you know that sort of you know struggle. Mm -hmm. Did you feel like you were struggling or did you just feel like it was just that's New York life? So that was. Yeah, no. Sometimes I knew that we were struggling because um, my mom was sometimes in the system, so um, you know we would have food stamps, mm -hmm. and so we would have like um, no frills brand of of corn flakes. <laughs> you know, we didn't have frosting flakes. We had you know yeah. a no brand. Two loops. <laughs> you know, two new loops. Um, and then when mom was doing well, then she'd do grocery shopping and then we would have the Fruit Loops. So um, based on the, the food consumption, I always knew where we were, where, whether we were doing well or not. Mm -hmm. um, and well meaning that we were, you know, had name brand and food, um, but obviously our living situation never changed. Yeah. So we were always, um, you know, a, a lot of us. We had uh, three closets. Yeah. And like I said, a one bedroom apartment. Um, so yeah. I never shared, uh, I've always shared um, a closet with my siblings and my mom. I always had to share everything, even a drawer. Well, wow. and that that's not, I mean, just in, you know, culturally speaking, and keep me honest, because, you know, I always say in my former life, <laughs> um, you know, my ex-wife is Dominican. Mm -hmm. And I know that just from that period of time and, and whatnot, you get a lot of family or they would get a lot of family that would come from DR. Mm -hmm. And they would just stay in this small apartment that they were that was already too small for them. Mm -hmm. But you know, if Theo was coming, like it's like, oh, come on, we have room. And I'm like, I would be like the husband, like, where is the room? Because like y'all are sleeping on top of each other. But uh, were the rats and mice as bad back then? Because they're bad now. Well, they stayed on our our, our uh, <laughs> daughter goes to NYU, so she has told us stories because she stayed yeah. with her mom in the Bronx and. Uh, I don't really know how no, New Yorkers come down here. They used to here. stay just in the subway when I lived up when there. When you lived up there back then? they just say, you know, we're going to share the blocks. Hey, yeah. so they're not, yeah. they need to pay, start paying the rent up there because sure. they're... <laughs> no, I mean, look, it was uh, mice and roaches, to be honest. And my yeah. mom is a is a cleaning lady. It was one of her many, many jobs. It ended yeah. up being her job uh, towards the end yeah. uh, of, of her uh, work career. And so she made it a point. Like, literally, I remember, like, hey, today is time to put the bombs for the, for the roaches. <laughs> wow. So we're leaving all day. So she would put those things on and we'd leave for eight hours and wow. come back and we would have to clean all, all, of, dead roaches. all of dead roaches and wow. that was just this part of growing up but my mom was always super clean that's what I do remember about her yeah. is that uh, I would go to my friends homes and you would go get a cup and the roaches are ro <laughs> the roaches are like, here my you mom go. Would, that was unacceptable to my yeah. mom like yeah. we we definitely lived in a very clean home no matter how many people were in it oh yeah for what, sure at what point um from growing up in I guess tight quarters was there like a switch at any point where for you, you knew like, okay, I need my own, I want my own and I'm going to go get my own. Like when did that start? When did that start to click for you? Yeah, I think in my teenage years, I mean, I think uh, the, the pivotal years for a young lady, 13, 14, 15, I wanted my own bed. I mean, I didn't even have my own bed. I slept with my sister. There wasn't a lot of space. Right. Um, I remember one time coming home from school and we had one queen size bed with four kids. And so I slept in the bed with my little sister, my little brother, and my older brother volunteered to sleep on the floor. And to wow. this day, like if, if all the family's together, he'll volunteer to sleep on wow. the floor. For all time's sake. For all yeah. time's sake. Um, but yeah, so I would say in my teenage years, I wanted nothing but to have my own space. I wanted to be able to use the bathroom and not have someone come in to brush their teeth while I'm taking a shower. Um, and so when most girls think, think about like, they dream about their wedding. I mean, I just kept dreaming about just having my own small space to wow. myself. Were you ever resentful at any point, just as you were getting older and you were becoming a young woman, you were a teenage and a teenager and so on and so forth. Was there ever any resentment for your circumstances? Did you ever feel like, 
why are we living like this versus why we can't live like that? Or was it just par for the course? And Yeah, I, I don't think I ever felt resentful, but definitely it was a very tough upbringing. Mm. Um, you know, not to get too into it, but it was a, a very difficult upbringing, especially for a young lady. Yeah. Um, you know, with my mom working seven days a week, I pretty much took care of my brother and sister. And mm. I, I would say that I became a mom at the age of nine when my wow. sister was born. Wow. Um, and so my, my responsibilities and duties was go to school, pick them up, Go, uh, I actually uh, was a dancer and uh, after really? school I was, I was kind of dancer we everything about? African jazz, ballet, no poles involved, no poles involved. No, no, no. <laughs> um, and so in order for me to participate in after school activities, I had to go pick up my little sister. Mm. And bring her with me and I remember my dance teacher making like a little spot for her to play with uh, so that I can participate, participate in after school activities and so I was always very responsible um, and I really felt like I raised children at a very young age and through all that there was it was just there was never a sense of why me why why can't I be the normal teenager that just gets to go do normal teenage things you never felt any of that yeah I mean I, I felt a certain kind of way and I think at one point I spoke to my dad because although my mom raised four kids on her own my dad was absolutely present mm, um, every involved. weekend he will pick us up but when they first split my dad didn't have a home for us to visit oh, yeah. um you know and I think that when when two people split you know obviously the, the typically the, the mom stays with the kids at the current home right. but people don't really look at um the dad like what happens to the dad right and so we're talking my dad is in his 20s you know yeah. and so he doesn't have an apartment so it took a couple of years and I remember vividly remember when my dad got his first apartment mm. a rental yeah. um and we got to visit he had no sofa no bed for us um but we made it work we had air mattress and we just made it work because it was about it was your dad so that's it, it. that's stuff didn't matter yeah, yeah. it does it doesn't and then all I remember is my dad always being present that's a great thing it actually. is mm -hmm. so that's uh flash forward to your first house that you purchased, um, I know we had exchanged some DMs in 2018, and we'll, we'll talk a little bit about that. Yes, <laughs> yeah. But um, tell us a little bit about, um, I remember you hitting, hitting me up, you had a condo mm -hmm. in Jersey, was it? Yes. And tell us a little bit about that experience, because we want to pe take people behind the front door of like really what it's like. Did you have an agent? What was that experience like? What year was it? Mm -hmm. um, I think when you had mentioned to me before, it was probably that 2007, 2008 time frame. Yep. And I had lost homes because uh, I had gotten into the whole investment properties and stuff like that. If everybody remembers, that, that crash in 2008 Eight. was no joke. So. Mm -hmm. If you could share with the audience what that was like, what your process was like, that'd yeah, be really interesting. Absolutely. Um, but I'll preface with uh, once I graduated college, because I felt like my way out of the hood mm -hmm. was getting an education. Yep. Um, so I went to college, came back, and I actually took over my mom's rent control. Where did you go to college? Did you leave New York? I did. I was I was determined to leave New York, to, determined to leave yeah. my home yeah. because this I knew else. I knew that the only way that I could get my own space yeah. was if I went away to college, not study in New York. Right. So I went to school in Boston. Okay. And at the age of 17, I, for the first time in my life, I had my own bed and my mm. own little dresser in college. I yeah. had a roommate, but, yeah. you know, I That was the closest it. thing to having your was a come up. It was yeah, the first sure. time that I had my own anything yeah. was 17. So fast forward, I graduate college. I'm, I'm dating someone. We move into my mom's rent control apartment because she ended up moving to Alabama, okay. which is significant because this is how I end up in Georgia, in Georgia in the future. Right, right. And so all the people, all your siblings that were growing up in the apartment, they had all got spread out space now or did you move back and there were still people in the space? That you yeah, moved? so my mom and the kids um, were still there and they were on their way to move. So my brother and sister were too young. Um, they were young, so they were moving with my mom to right. Alabama to finish high school. Um, and then my older brother had already moved out. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I took over the rent control apartment and for me it was an opportunity to um, save money because I'm still focused. I still want a home. I still, for me, I, I felt a little bit sad to have to move back to the apartment that I uh, was raised because in. Because you felt like, well, I left this. Yeah, uh, so uh, I, like, I went to college. I did I did all the right things. Yeah. I end up back here. Why am I here again? Yeah, but I did remodel it a little bit, you know, yeah. and just made it a little bit homey, but it had a lot of memories. But look, at, ultimately it was rent control. Mm -hmm. And you know, at the time I graduated college in 2000, I mean, I think the rent was like $500 to be and, honest. And just for people, cause I know 
the rent control situation, that's, at least it used to be a big deal in New right. York. I don't know if they still allow it or have it. So for the audience that's from a different place, mm -hmm. you want like, so rent control is just legally, there's a certain percentage that they can or can't increase the rent by. Is that's that a correct. fixed percentage every year? Or what is that just for context? Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, 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 of course. Um, so rent control, exactly that. You explained it great. And so my mom could have the opportunity to do a two or four year lease. And then um, the percentage that it goes up legally has to be like very low, like mm -hmm. one or two percent. And so at the time when I moved in, if the rent was five hundred dollars, um, I actually know this because I was looking to rent a different apartment. The rent there was uh, eleven $1 hundred dollars. Mm. You were offset. Yeah. So <laughs> eleven hundred, fresh out of college versus five hundred. Yeah. Um, the apartment was going to be available, so I took over my mother's lease. Okay. And they make you keep that like in the family, meaning like once like if. If it wasn't you and they decided, hey, your mother's moving and she let them know that, they now update the rent to whatever current market. Correct. Right. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. And we had to prove that I was her daughter, yes. like that I was uh, related. I right. dated somebody, um, cover your ears. <laughs> I, I know this story. I dated somebody and um, I thought it was strange while we were dating because um, he grew up in this apartment. It was his childhood apartment. We were adults now. We were like in our 30s. Mm -hmm. But um, his mother, like, that's where she raised all of them. Mom gets old, so she has to move out and move in with the sister. And it was such a big deal at that time because they were trying to make sure that they didn't lose this apartment. Mm -hmm. And so for me, I was confused because there was nothing really special about the apartment. It was an old apartment, you, you know. Yep. And so I was like, let it go. Like, like, what are we doing? And I never really understood it until he told me that the rent was I think at the time it was like 575 max. Mm -hmm. But he had was born and raised in this apartment and we were like in our thirties. So I was like, how are you in this apartment only paying this? And then the kicker was they decided that they were gonna convert that building into um uh condos. Oh really? So now you have people that were in this sort of grandfather uh, rental rent control situation paying five seventy five a month mm. and then they were actually converting it to where people had to now pay and I think at the time it was like six hundred thousand dollars to buy it and so that made me kind of understand the value of the whole rent control situation and why if, if you've ever been fortunate to have that as an opportunity you kind of keep it you work you look, you I work can see why so I mean it's, it's pretty affordable but like what made you even start thinking and transitioning to that thought process of owning something. Mm -hmm. What was that in your 20s? Did a situation happen? Did a friend tell you something? Or was it just you that wanted to be a homeowner at that age? I um, So when I started college yeah. in 1996, yeah. um, my my dad bought a house for the first time. Okay, um, so you got He that bought experience. it in, in Pennsylvania, so he moved from New York to Pennsylvania. Okay. Um, and it was significant to me. It was the first time that anyone in my in my family owned a home. Right. Um, and, you know, while I was in college, like, you know, financially things were really tough. And I remember just going really being hungry in college and not having enough money to, to eat food, yeah. um, which was really impactful to me. And then later on in life, when I was talking to my dad or my stepmom, you know, this even though they had just bought a house, they were eating sardines out of a can mm. of crackers. And so we were both sort of in a parallel, like, yes, this huge accomplishment, a house was bought, but they I was the first in my family to go to college. Mm. We had no education on the bursar's office, what it means to pay for college. Apply for financial aid. Apply for financial yeah. aid. Mm. Um, I actually was returned. My mom took me on my first day. We packed my mom's van with my belongings drove to Boston. Mm -hmm. um, they said, your financial aid didn't go through. In order for you to stay, you have to pay $3,000. And my mom looked at me like, I don't have that money. Right. And so we drove back to New York. No. Mm -hmm. mm. I was determined to go to school. I was determined to get an education. So I called my dad and I said, you have to drive me up. You have to help me. And so two weeks later, we, we tried again. And my dad packed me up this time with all my things. Wow. And my dad was able to, you know, financially went through. And then my dad was able to get me room and board. Um, and I finally started college. That's for the win. Yeah, that's that's win. for the win. Yeah. So, you know, at this point now, when I graduate college, my dad has a home, okay. right? And so uh, it's beautiful. Uh, I love the independence. You don't have neighbors. I grew up in a, in a building. Right. Um, so I was determined with my partner at the time. I told him what my, my goals and my plans were. Um, and then 
six, seven years later, we're still in the rent control apartment. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's, it's, um, we're in Manhattan. Yeah. We're a couple of train stops away from work. Right, I mean, city. really is the idea. That's how to do it in the 20s. Yeah. 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 But for me, I wanted more. Yeah. I mean, for me, I've been traveling since I was young. Yeah. Um, I see other people, other culture, how other people live. I just wanted to see. I, I've always felt different from mm -hmm. my friends in the neighborhood. Mm -hmm. um, and so my partner and I at the time were not seeing eye to eye about our futures. And so I left. I left him in the rent control apartment. No. Um, <laughs> I left him in the contr rent Mommy, control apartment. That? Yeah, mom almost killed me. I ended up moving to Pennsylvania to my dad's house. And yeah. I asked my dad if I could move in with him. Um, I, I had said like six to eight months so that I can save enough money to buy something. I was determined to buy something. Mm. And I'm still working in Manhattan. So I'm commuting from Pennsylvania. Wow. I know the bus. Wow. So I would get up at four o'clock in the morning, catch the 5.30 a.m. bus, travel into the city um, at night in darkness, work all day. I worked in law firms, so it wasn't a nine to five. It was a nine to seven, eight, nine, whatever 10, the whatever the deal the yeah. closes to then get on a bus and go back to Pennsylvania. Now, for full disclosure, my, my dad has been doing this for 20 something, almost 30 years. Yeah. I couldn't do it. I was exhausted okay. and um, I want to say like three to four months later, um, my dad was at a house swarming and he said, I think I found where you're going to live. Mm. Here's the realtor information. Come check it out. And I'm like, New Jersey. <laughs> I'm not living in New well, Jersey, well, Dad. New York, if, you, if you live in New York, right? If you live yes. in New York, you would rather go to Pennsylvania than to go <laughs> right across the bridge to, to, to I get that this done and fried. Yes, yes. So you know what? Yeah, I respect my dad's opinion and he, he, knows, he knows me. Yeah. And so I have been looking in um, the Bronx. So the Bronx has some beautiful beautiful neighborhoods. Mm -hmm. The issue was that I was able to afford the, the apartment. A, a lot of them are co-ops, not condos. And But the HOA, the monthly HOA was a $1,000 wow. on top of the mortgage. Was there a doorman or anything? Yeah, yeah. Uh, some of them had doorman. I was going to say for $1,000, you better. Yeah, but but I mean, the amenities yeah. weren't anything to, to Not justify $1,000. $1,000. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So here I go. I visit this apartment in New Jersey that my dad spoke about. Um, I check out the condominium. It's a condo, which uh, to me uh, was better than a co-op because mm. you get to own mm -hmm. what's behind the door okay. versus a co-op. Everybody owns a little piece of right. everything. And they get to take a vote on Correct. whether or not you can even buy into yes. the co-op. So. Correct. Correct. So I knew condo was better, better off. Um, so the story goes, uh, and this, this, this is in Patterson, New Jersey. So, I mean, technically I'm going from one hood to the other, but it was a, it was a, it was a beautiful building. It had a doorman. Okay. Um, it had laundry facilities. I've always packed <laughs> my clothes, you oh, know, went laundry. outside, went to the laundromat, did my laundry and came back to the apartment. So that was a big deal. So to me, yeah. it was a big deal to have the laundromat yeah. downstairs, downstairs. Yeah. in the same building. In the same building. I can see that. Um, so look, we're, we're talking 2007, okay? Interest rates at the time were about six to six and a half, okay? And um, the apartment that I wanted was actually under contract. They showed me a different layout. Okay. And I said, no, I really like the one on the sixth floor. Um, and then, so she's like, I'm sorry, it's on the contract. Like two or three months later, the realtor calls me and she's like, hey, I think this apartment is meant for you. The contract fell through. She's like, go see if you can get a mortgage. I sh when I tell you guys I shopped around, I went to every bank that you can think of. Yeah. I went to Rocket Mortgage, uh, like anything online. But were you shopping around because you couldn't get a mortgage or were you like intuitive enough to shop around to try to get the best rate? The best Correct. Rate? Okay. I was looking for the best rate. Um, now at this point, you know, I had some money saved, which I thought I would use as a down payment. Okay. Um, and I wasn't going to have enough money to furnish my condo for, for full transparency, but I didn't care, right? Uh, I lived with less. So for me, it was important just to get the, the home at this time. Um, but nothing, everything was six, six and a half, right? And so when I'm calculating my monthly payment plus the HOA, so the HOA in the condominium in Jersey was at the time $500 okay. versus the thousand in the Bronx. Okay. Um, and so what happens, I told her, I said, look, uh, my, my numbers aren't calculating properly. I'm not going to be able to afford it at this six and a half interest rate. If so you, do you mind disclosing like the price range? Just because I think people, 
always say oh, New York, New Jersey, well, the, the price point. Yeah, interest rates back then, I think you said were like six and a half. Six and a half. Mm -hmm. So it's kind of relative almost yeah. to where we, where are, we are now. now. Yeah. So it'll be interesting to find out what the price point was back then. Yeah, right. so my yeah. price point that I knew that I would be able to afford was between two and 250. Okay. So that was where I was trying to stay. In now, Florida. was that number just out of, because we, we go through this all the time. Mm -hmm. Was that just like out of thin air or did you like, reach out to each lender and they kind of told you what that pre-approved amount was. No, that was based on how much I calculated that I could afford. Okay, so you used like online tools yes. and stuff like online that? Okay, calculators. gotcha. Oh, Kat is a nerd. I know. <laughs> I know. Yeah, first I wanted to see what I can afford. So I used online calculators. I put in, you know, what I make, what my expenses were. I mean, yeah. at the time I didn't have much because I was living with my dad. Right, right. Um, and so I'm like, I knew what I can afford um, on a monthly basis for yeah. a mortgage. And so I shopped online for mortgages. I, I like went into brick and mortar banks okay. and oh. would sit with reps. Were you honest? Because here's what I think a lot of people do today. Mm -hmm. I think people aren't honest with themselves as mm -hmm. far as their real budget by way of they're not honest with what their expenses are. So some people will say, oh, yeah, I only spend a thousand dollars a month. Mm -hmm. But when you start to peel back the layers, it's like, well, how many subscription services right. do you have? Mm -hmm. How many like just dinner out and your subscription services are over the budget that you said that you had. So mm -hmm. were you really honest with like, no, this is really what I'm able to do? Or were you trying to make the numbers work so that mm -hmm. you could do anything at all as far as buying a house? So I grew up poor, and so I still had a poor mentality. So even though I had a, a, a salary and I was working, um, to me, uh, I had a little bit of, um, like, I really can't afford that. And so I always lived uh, below my means. Um, I enjoyed seeing the savings in my account, and the more money I saved, the more I felt like I, I feel like I'm finally succeeding. And so I was very honest with myself what I could and couldn't afford. Actually, I said I can afford between 12, uh, 200 and 250, and I actually got pre-approved for 350. Okay. Um, and so the condo ended up uh, uh, coming in at 250. Wow. Uh, when so I you ended still up stayed by. with your budget. I did. You went of, under budget. Yeah, because you really could have got. The told you. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, the, what the, le the, the lender doesn't take thing, certain things under consideration, right? right. My commute into the city. Right. I never had to commute into the city, even though I was doing it from Pennsylvania. But that's when I learned. Uh, it's very expensive to commute into the city when previously I would just jump on the subway for whatever the subway cost was um, and then get back home, right? Yeah. So my expenses were going to be different. So I knew that I needed money. I, didn't, I also didn't want to um, spend all the money that I just saved, yeah. right? Yeah. So I needed money to live. I mean, it, I like how you went about it because a lot of times what happens is that it's just like when you go buy a car, right? You can go into the dealership and they're going to tell you on paper you can afford the hundred thousand dollar whatever but you know how your bills work mm -hmm. you know how your expenses come in and so we try to tell people to think about that the same way when you're buying a house don't go get this pre-approval for this astronomical amount of money and right. you're out shopping for that astronomical you know that mm -hmm. amount and then find out that really your budget is for mortgage two thousand dollars a month but we're shopping for four thousand dollar a month mortgages right. so the fact that you actually went about it in an honest way mm -hmm. with yourself, I think it saved you and probably your realtor at the time yeah. a whole lot of headache that we deal with. And, and not only that, remember this is 2007. No one, n nor did I, can foresee what was coming a year later. Yes. And the fact that I budgeted this way was extremely significant for how I was able to keep my condo for 13 years. Yeah. Um, so that was very significant. Did you have uh, what they call a buyer agent or were you working with the agent that was selling the actual condos in that building? Today? Yeah, so uniquely, you? Um, the, the this uh, I think you had mentioned earlier about the rent control that it was turning into a condo. So this building was turning, it was a conversion from rental to condos. Okay. So ha you know the, the owner of the building was renovating some apartments selling those kind of sell. yeah. right and so what the apartment that i wanted was already renovated uh, everything was upgraded um so i was dealing with the agents of the building okay. uh, she represented me in new jersey and so like every state has their own state right, law right. so in new jersey you're actually required to have an attorney so i also needed to get uh, an attorney for the transaction and as you well. have to find that one your own yes oh that's very different well, mm -hmm. it was almost like a dual agency too because if she was representing the Seller. Seller and the buyer. 
um, I wonder if it was really in your best interest, but you know, you felt like you got a good, good deal out of it. Yeah, yeah. so the, the seller, although she, she was ultimately the buyer agent for me, yeah. um, and then the seller had his own attorney, oh, and so there was a, the there was attorneys. there was space to negotiate. So the agent represented both, but each party had their own own legal attorney. Got Correct. You, got you. Correct. So you could look out for your best interest, making sure looking yeah the paperwork and everything mm -hmm. like that. That's yeah. So back to the mortgage, right? So yeah. actually, she had gotten the the apartment that I wanted went on the contract again for a second That's time, right. and right. so I said, you know what? If it's not meant for me, it's not meant for me. I, I truly believe that what God God has in store for me is going to happen, right? So I, 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 you know, threw my hands up and that's it. A third time my phone rings and now I've been working with this lady for a couple of months and um, she calls me and she's like, listen, this is the second contract that falls through. This is your apartment. I don't care what you do, get yourself a mortgage. <laughs> and so um, at the time I worked in Midtown East Side. There was a Bank of America and I walked in there like I did many other banks, uh, spoke to a rep, still giving me the same quotes. Yeah. And uh, I kind of felt a little bit defeated and someone stops me and says, hey, is everything OK? Where how was the customer service? And I just told him randomly, I'm just trying to lock in a mortgage and I just can't get the, the uh, you know, good rate. Or he said he handed me a, a card, a business card and said, uh, this is the first uh, Bank of America's first time home buyers program. Oh. Give them a call. No one had mentioned this before. Um, so I gave them a call. And it's funny because I, I wasn't making a lot of money. Um, but to first time home buyers program, you, you're supposed to make a certain right. amount of money. It kind of benefited money. you actually. Right. You and so, much, you, you know, I was making on. just a little too much to be, um, oh, to to be eligible, to, eligible right, for yeah. it. Um, and so they a asked me questions and I said, yeah, well, I help my mom. I support her, you know. So you were able to start. The so I was able to get into the program. Oh. Okay. So hear me out. This is unheard of in 2007. I got 100% financing. Okay. No PMI. Nice. And my rate was 4.5 when I was getting quoted 6 point something, 6.5, 6, 6.5. Yeah. And because of this program and Bank of America, shout them out, right. um, I was able to close out my condo. That's fabulous. Mm -hmm. And so how was it? You closed on the, the condo. This mm -hmm. is 2007. 2007. What happens in 2008? The market crashes. Yes. Did you keep your job? Did What, what was your thought process? That um, I was scared yeah, <laughs> to say the least. So I work in law firms. I'm a paralegal at this point yeah. and left and right. My, my colleagues are getting let go. Yeah. And thankfully, um, I did not lose my job. Yeah. I think for me, when I first started my career in legal, I did uh, bankruptcy restructuring, which is chapter 11 for, so you for companies. Right. Yes. <laughs> and then I became really curious. And then I started and I learned the lending side, like you have a lender and a borrower. Right. And so at the time in 2008, I was a lending re paralegal. What happens is, is that now the market is bad and people are filing, uh, companies are filing for bankruptcy. Yeah. They say, hey, Kathleen, you have a background in restructuring. I said, I sure do. And so I was able to um, move towards where the economy was going and had the skill sets. And so I had a job, but I didn't have a lot of overtime because that's where most of the paralegals make their money. money. So I, I will for full transparency because I really would love to be just transparent so that people can learn um, in 2008, when the market crashed, it affected mostly my mom. My mom lost her house. My mom lost her job. Mm -hmm. And so I think, you know, towards the end of 08, 09, she moved in with me. Mm -hmm. And so now I, I have, you know, a person that I'm supporting. Yeah. And so I started using my credit card. Mm -hmm. So I was able to pay my mortgage with my salary. But then Expenses. for the for the first time in my life, I had to put groceries on a credit card. Mm -hmm. um, and it was tough, but I was just doing what I could to survive. Was that because, because your mom had moved at this point, prior to Alabama. So I'm assuming that was a rental situation where she and your brother moved and then yes. she comes back to New York or New Jersey at this point yes. with you. Mm -hmm. So was it just the extra headcount that made you now have to rely on credit cards to get by or was that going to be the case either way because of what was happening in OE? In extra headcount and less salary. Mm -hmm. So um, a, a paralegal in New York, let, let, just for numbers sake, let's say that you make 60000 a year, right. but you work around the clock and so you can actually make six figures with all the overtime. Right. There's no overtime at this point. So whatever my base salary is, and I'm so accustomed to making extra money. Yeah. 
Um, and then I also have another head count. So I did what I could to survive. Um, and then, I mean, after that, like, you know, I, uh, Bank of America sent me a letter in 2009 and said, we're moder remodifying your mortgage. Oh, wow. Really? Yeah, they were doing a lot of those things back then. Yeah, yeah. and so a remodification is house. different from a, a, re refinance. a refinance, right. correct. And so they approached me about the remodification. So it's not a new mortgage. They voluntarily, right, because let's get, banks are not in the business of owning homes. No, right. So they were doing what they could to keep people owning their homes, With right? Their presence, yeah. yeah. Correct. So they voluntarily uh, minimized my interest rate to like 3.7. Wow. You already had a 4.7. I had a 4.5 or 4.25. So now I'm at 3.7. What that means is that my mortgage goes down $600. Wow. And so I was always able to pay my mortgage. I was so blessed to be able to pay my mortgage. And those $600 helped because then now I it had money. It offset the expenses that you were putting on your credit cards. On my credit cards. cards. Absolutely. Yeah. And so how long, I guess at this point, how long did the, we'll refer to your mom as the extra head count. <laughs> <laughs> Love you, mom. But, um, how long was there the extra head count that now you had sort of taken responsibility for before? Until that changed, and I know like your mom went back to Alabama. So eventually, yeah, eventually. yeah. So my mom stood with me for a year. Then she went to my brother's for a year to help him raise his two daughters. Pass mom around. And I'm then so mom. Mad at and then mom. <laughs> no, that she's she's a free spirit. Yeah. And then mom went to Puerto Rico for a year, and, okay. and actually was blessed that she was able to spend that last year with my grandmother before my yeah. grandmother passed. And then ultimately, I asked my mom, "Where do you want to live?" And she says, "I still love Alabama." So then, you know, three, uh, four years after just shuffling around she was just passing her here yeah here. <laughs> um she returned to alabama but she was she lived with my aunt in in a room and this becomes significant later um in in my story as to my mom's story as well yeah so your aunt was living in alabama yeah that's, that's how that's we all connection. yes that is the I was connection like, how does anybody from the north yeah, we the are north the only puerto ricans in, in alabama, in alabama. <laughs> alabama. All of me, right? yes yes so you ended up uh buying her a home i in, did in i did so um I, for full transparency in 2013 2014 yeah. i i sat down like i normally do and i decided to face my finances and I saw my credit card debt and, you know, actually before that, actually in 2013, 2014, I became debt free. Okay. So it took me about three years to pay off all the debt that I had incurred during the, the height of the recession. And so now I'm debt free. So now I can start saving money. Okay. Um, in 2017, um, my, my, my sister calls me and says, look, mom's not doing too well. And so I flew down to Alabama to visit her like I always do at least once a year. Mm -hmm. And my mom was working at a gas station, you know, making minimum hustling. wage. Yep. My mother uh, still is hustling, right? right? Yeah, she could do um, but, you know, she's, she's refilling the refrigerators and just physically it's, it's becoming a lot. And she's working seven days a week. And so I prayed about it. I prayed about it and I said, God, if, if I have the ability to help my mom, I want to be able to help her. And so I got it in my head that I wanted to buy my mom a house. Wow. Wow. And I started praying about it. Now I have savings, but not a lot of savings, yeah. right? But I'm getting my, my footing back. Did you call Bank of America? Again? <laughs> 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 Um, and so listen, um, November of 2017, mm -hmm. I was visiting my mom for Thanksgiving. The whole family was, but I got in early. Okay. Right. Okay. And I just wanted to do recon. I didn't know what the market was in this small town where my mother lives. Okay. So I can I reached out to the real estate agent. There was two. Okay. I saw the one with the, the most friendliest face out of the two. And I reached out to her. How'd you find them online? Or online. Was okay. yep, yeah. Online. Yeah. Um, and so I reached out to her and I said, I wanted to see some houses. Okay. Um, what are the, what are the ranges? Yeah. And, um, I got in, my sister picked me up from the airport in, in Atlanta mm -hmm. and my mom had no idea I was in yet. And so we checked out a couple of houses. The last house that we walked into, it had been empty for three years. Uh, there was a one, a, one owner. Uh, a couple and the dad died then the mom died and so the daughter had this house closed up for three years and she decided okay it's time to let go and so she was selling it oh. and my sister walked in it smelled it was I mean it had like 
Oh, I mean, it was just, it was in bad shape. And I walked in and I said, I think this is it. <laughs> I think we're going to put mom right here. Um, so you had a vision for it? I had a vi the, the moment I walked in, um, it was five minutes from my aunt's house. So I knew that they would be close. Yeah. And um, I just, I just felt it in my spirit. And now, your mom at this point. She never asked. She no. never said, I wish you could buy me a house. That was oh. not even a conversation with you. Yeah, what made no. you want to do this? No, my yeah. mother has never asked for anything, oh. um, which is which makes me want to give her oh. everything that I can. It means even more, yeah. Yeah, yeah. my mother is uh, just an incredible human being. Yeah. Um, and, and again, like, I just, it, just, it was in my spirit that I wanted oh. to do this. And I think a lot of kids, especially a lot of kids that come um, from poverty and they make it, you know, whether it's an NFL star or whatever, the first thing they say is, I want to get my mom a house. house. Yeah. And I'm like, well, I'm not an NFL star. I don't make a lot of money. I am the most humble person. But with God, I'm going to be able to do this. You didn't want to do this with your brothers and sisters? It was just like something you wanted yeah, to do? Yeah. So, you know, for me, now that I'm a homeowner yeah. and I know what it takes, I, for me, it was important for me to get the house because I didn't want my siblings to feel obligated to put money into a house. So for me, the clean way is I buy the house as my house. And then, you know, my mom's house, but obviously my name is on it. And then the siblings can get together and help her because you know what? You, there was a lot of work to be done yeah. inside. And then my mom needs money to live so they can help my mother in other, in other ways, ways. But this was your project. But this was my project. So how did that, so we bought the house. Yes. Now, what projects did you do? How did you get it up to the standards for your mom? Yeah, yeah. so I bought the house. I actually negotiated the, the, the closing costs, uh, not the closing costs, the price. Right. Um, I was able to get it to a really good price. You did it yourself or did you have an agent? No, I had the agent. Yeah, I used have, the same okay. the same agent, okay. but okay. Um, I, I negotiated. Okay. <laughs> Did not get it's much a, help? From it's them? a small town, so yeah. she was she was trying to convince me that they weren't going to go for it. And I'm like, what, what's what the worst? Hurt, right? What is the worst they're going to do? Is right, say right. no? Right, right. Um, but they said yes, right? And so um, I put twenty percent down in in my mom's house because I knew that I didn't want PMI because yes. I didn't have PMI in the condo, and that was kind of nice to save, you know, two yeah. three hundred dollars. I think you had to, right? Because it was considered investment not investment correct. It's an investment property. Correct. It's my second home right. so it's an investment property so okay. I put 20% down you look around and I'm like I don't have the money to fix this place so I'm like okay let's focus she needs a room and a bathroom and so all hands on deck my my siblings came uh, family members came we were painting we were like just doing everything ourselves it goes back to um and I'm just going to say the way I say, you know, I don't mean it, mm -hmm. by it, but it goes back to that poor man's mentality mm -hmm. because a lot of times people are quick to say like, oh, I got to pay somebody to do this. Right. I gotta, how much is it going to cost somebody else to come do it? But you kind of, your instincts are like, okay, so we're capable of doing this. We're going to do it ourselves and figure it out. Sweat equity. Yeah. Let me tell you, when you don't have anything else, you have sweat equity. And so look, there's certain things that I had to pay for. I had to get someone, a contractor to come and redo the bathroom. Yeah. Uh, they, that was outside of our, our capabilities. Um, but the room, pulling out rugs and you know all that, and we made it work. I mean, I closed in January, actually. Um, yeah, this, this month I closed in, in my mom's house in 2017 wow. and it took us about three months to get it to a good place. I mean, the smell was still there. I mean, it's just like it's a lot of, it's an there. older house. Um, and my goal was for my mom to have a place where her grandchildren can visit her and for her to have her own. My mom's never owned anything. We, she always lived in an apartment. Yeah. I always lived in an apartment up until my very first house with you guys. Yes. Mm -hmm. Well, at this, you know. I flash forward to uh, when you got to meet us. Yes. So just for the audience out there, um, we started Great Homes ATL in 2015, but we were with a brokerage firm. Uh, it wasn't until 2019 that Kurt and I went for our license and that we started Great Homes ATL in 2020. So during this time when you're working for another brokerage firm, it's really like more of a team than it is your own brokerage firm. So. We didn't really have processes down. Kurt was working in corporate America. I was doing this full time, starting to film my home tours and stuff like that, which we started to become pretty big on Instagram. Um, so in preparation for this uh, podcast, you know, I said, I gotta go back to the DMs and just see on Instagram. Who was these chicks that was sliding all chick? the DMs? So I'm like, how did they, <laughs> because, you know, obviously we've now done hundreds and hundreds of deals a very special connection with Kathleen, which we'll get into as the story progresses. Yeah. But so it wasn't even, hey, Mark, could you help me 
find a home it was do you know a contractor in alabama and i'm like why is this chick asking me do you not see our name is gray homes atl yeah. we we get that all the time people hit us up in north carolina but you build in this yeah. state and it's like yeah it says gray homes atl so like, and we build in alaska come on and so but i was actually nice about it because there wasn't a process yeah. we became a process once really uh kirk came on you know full time mm-hmm. but it was actually a very, you know, back and forth conversation looking back at it. Mm-hmm. So from your perspective, because mm-hmm. we always like to hear because we're the ones that are recording the content. We're putting our, we started putting ourselves out there. Mm-hmm. People started once in a while, Kurt would start coming on camera. We started doing shows like Cocktails with Kurt mm-hmm. and stuff like that. What was it? Do you remember, you know, were you just a social media person? What drew you to Instagram? <laughs> How did you find us? Was it hashtags? Because people always have a story of how they yeah i'm still not a social media person (laughs) and that's why we're so grateful that you did our podcast and i'm private um so don't look for me (laughs) i'm taken but no um so i knew that i was exhausted like living in new york and then i moved to new jersey and then commuting into new york my commute was an hour and a half Mm -hmm. um i would drive to the bus stop take a bus in then take the subway i was exhausted and i knew that at some point I wanted to slow down and I wanted to be in a quieter place with a home. I wanted to own a house for the first time in my life. And, you know, I I decided I'm not going to wait for me to be married with children. If I can do it now, I want to do it. And so what made sense? I wanted to be closer to my mom and my sister who still live in Alabama. But Alabama wasn't for you. Alabama Alabama was definitely (laughs) not for me. You had heard about Georgia? You heard about Atlanta? Well, I always fly into Georgia when I visit my mom. because She's about an hour and a half from the airport. And so I started looking at random realtors. Once you click on one realtor in in any state, you start start getting all the other realtors, right? And so I had randomly hit hit up one realtor and just asking about like price point or whatever, because at this point I'm I'm studying, I'm getting information. Um, I'm, I'm working my process in my brain to see if this can happen. And you, you bump, I bumped into you, your page, and there was something like your transparency, um, your voice, the tone of your voice I get was so I get, friendly. I get that a lot. I get, look, funny, I need to do voiceover work because I get that you just gassed him up. But funny but story, you were at a closing, actually a couple of closings, okay. and couples have said, and I don't know how to take this, but they said, we listen to your videos in bed together and like there's it's something so about your voice that's soothing. <laughs> so I was sitting there like, this is my spouse. So Aren't you lucky? Aren't you lucky? <laughs> His voice is not soothing. <laughs> so it depends on what's going on, right? What's going on, so. And so this is 2018. So now that you know my story, 2017, I buy this fixer upper yeah, yeah. and I'm having a difficult time trying to get people to do work in my mom's right. house. And so uh, there was something so honest about you um and so i'm like i know that this is not about buying a house but let me ask if he has some some contacts um and to be honest you actually connected me to another realtor and she knew some a contractor in alabama and i ended up reaching out to these people so it worked it worked right ended up yeah um so you're watching my videos Mm -hmm. you do you know anything about the greater Atlanta area, do you know like what part of town you want to live in? No, like I have because, certain criteria. Yeah. I wanted to be near the airport because I do travel a lot for okay. work and personal. Right. Um, I wanted to be south of Atlanta because I wanted to be close or, or have my family accessible. I didn't want to be two to three hours away from them because that defeats yeah, the point. The Correct. So an hour, hour and a half max. And so um, I told you what my criteria was, yeah. but my goal at the time when I reached out to you was to buy land yes i remember that five acres five acres <laughs> that's what i had and i want to build it that's what and i had by the way i have a budget of like three hundred thousand. <laughs> i <laughs> definitely was not around because kurt would have been like this shit ain't buying a lot but the reason why I wanted to buy land first was because I didn't know what my timing was. Mm-hmm. I know yeah. that eventually I wanted to end up here, but I didn't know what the timing was. So if I own land, then I can start building when I was when ready. Felt like it, yeah. But you yeah. had no idea what that process looked like. No. It was a, like, cause we, we deal with that all the time where people think that everybody wants, you know, that exactly that, that one acre, four acres, five acres of land. 
And what happens is they don't understand that it's a totally different process to mm -hmm. hire an architect, develop the land, mm -hmm. underground utilities if you want, all those type of things. Yeah. And it definitely doesn't fit that three hundred thousand yeah, dollar budget. Yeah. So I remember in the DMs we were going back and forth. Mm -hmm. Well, a little give and take. Um, so but did I, you know anybody? Like, did you know anybody in Greater Atlanta other than just flying in and out? Like, no. So you really were kind of stepping out there on faith like pretty much on so, faith yeah. what was it i guess i'll ask the question to both of you mm -hmm. yeah so what was it that shifted the exchanges from search for a contractor mm -hmm. initially mm -hmm. to um like now you've somehow convinced her to buy here in yeah. atlanta like what was that um, yeah. yeah, from my perspective, you know, at that time where Great Homes ATL, it wasn't a situation where we were like, you know, we had blown up yet, right? So I had a little bit more time to give and take to those type of conversations. And you know me as well, because he used to listen to me on phone calls, talking to people and hearing like Complete their life time. story. I think time. I was a therapist more than I was a realtor <laughs> in my early, early career. But I think what happened was... Um, you know, Kathleen just always can't approach me very um, kindly. It wasn't like, well, where is this? Where is that? She was actually like, I was watching you guys on Instagram live. I was tuning into your conversations. I really like you. Mm -hmm. And I think it just started with that. And then I just had a process because I had started to go out to so many new home communities, right? So I had started building a rapport with on-site agents. And one of my processes was to highlight those communities. And I think you started watching some of those mm -hmm. videos and like, where is that? Mm -hmm. And that's that kind of sparked and so up. you entertained that. Yeah, I did. I didn't even ask for a pre-approval. You didn't ask for a pre-approval. I'm glad y'all met before I came. <laughs> to right. We probably would not be sitting here in this. No, place. we wouldn't. But it was so organic. And um, yeah. I, uh, what I remember specifically is telling him, I don't want to waste your time because I'm doing recon at this point, right? Mm -hmm. So, and I think he appreciated that. Yeah. So he sent me to other agents. Um, that were at these new communities. So I actually came to Atlanta about a few times, two to three times, didn't meet Mark yet, but I would meet other agents, yeah. on-site agents of these communities. Yeah, She yes. was a you over, like, you I, She, she did it without a buyer brokerage agreement. She she was not no like agreement. technically a client. It was all on faith. Right on right. faith and I'm loyal. Like I love Mark. That's what I found out. So I'm super loyal building a house and like all of these things are Wonderful going things great. I'm right highly now. favored and now I'm diagnosed with breast cancer. And my aunt passed away of breast cancer, ironically enough, at my same age in her early 40s. Hey guys, I hope you enjoyed this week's episode. Make sure you subscribe to our YouTube channel at Great Homes ATL. We've got a lot of great stuff in store for you. Now stay tuned for next week's episode. If you haven't already, make sure you set your notifications and subscribe to Behind the Front Door Podcast.